Hey everyone, hope you guys are doing well. Welcome back to the Medical Minis channel in which we are now continuing our radiology playlist. Last time we were talking about the lungs and in this video we will be talking about the heart and what I want to do as in the last video I want to give you a general overview and essentially give you a better understanding and make you basically more comfortable trying to figure out what is if anything going wrong with the heart okay so yeah without further ado let's just jump into it okay now with the start we have to know the cardiac silhouette and what i mean by this is just the basic outline and yeah, so there are basically two ways to analyze the silhouette. You have the anterior view and you have your lateral view, your anterior radiograph and your lateral radiograph. In your anterior radiograph, I have illustrated to you the important borders that we need to know. In turquoise, okay, one second, let's get the laser pointer out, okay. Now, we can split the borders into right and left okay as and as we can see from the heart we see a nice uh, physiological outline and the heart is 50 percent than the total diameter of the thoracic wall or just under 50 percent okay and so with the right border, what we need to know and what you only need to know is the following. We have the right atrium, as we can see here, and the superior vena cava, superiorly and not so apparent, but inferiorly, we can see the inferior vena cava. But keeping things uh, a bit more simpler, right atrium and superior, superior vena cava and in the left border we can see the very apparent left ventricle and the uh, left atrium accompanying this okay so we do see a little bit of the left atrium but most of the left border is consisted or consists of the left ventricle okay and with the right, most of this uh, border consists of the right atrium and the superior vena cava. Okay, so this is your anterior view, your anterior cardiac silhouette. And if we move to the lateral view, we can see here that we see now the right ventricle in the anterior portion of the heart and in the more posterior aspect we see the left ventricle okay now in this left uh, lateral radiographic view we see in this picture here that most of the heart consists in this view of the left ventricle and the left atrium however in this view we see that there is an extension which is this right ventricle and that's why the most anterior part in this view is the right ventricle okay and i guess this is just the actual morphology in this particular aspect this particular view it's just the way the heart is shaped okay so yeah anteriorly we can see the right ventricle posteriorly we can see the left ventricle and a bit more superiorly we can see the left atrium this diagram uh, makes it a bit more easier to see so yeah it's kind of like this acorn morphology now i want to ask you some questions here okay so first of all we need to 
identify ourselves with the surrounding structures and a mediastinum. Here we can see the retro sternal space because here is your sternum and this is behind. Uh, here we see the retro cardiac space because retro behind, cardiac heart. Here you can just about see the actual ascending and descending aorta and of course uh, in front of this aorta we would see the esophagus okay now keeping all this in mind and the actual morphology of the heart in mind how would the retrosternal space become blocked how would this space here become blocked? Well, what is in contact with the sternum, at least more than the other parts of the heart? It would be your ventricles, right? So, imagine if we enlarged the ventricles, this would compress the retro sternal space, right? So, if there's any ventricular enlargement, this would compress the retrosternal space. Alternatively, the retrocardiac space, the atrium is more directly associated with the retrocardiac space and therefore atrial enlargement would compress this area. However, that's not the only thing that could poten potentially compress this space. Because if the ventricle is enlarged, this by, extension will, this by extension would cause an atrial enlargement just because the atrium is directly connected to the ventricles. If this enlarged and it was moving in this direction, the atrium would also move in the same direction and therefore cause a retrocardiac occlusion. And so what would happen to the posterior organ structures? So what would be posterior here? The esophagus, right? So what would happen if in a situation we only knew that the esophagus was being compressed in a significant fashion or a less significant fashion? If it's a less, uh, less significant compression, then this would be due to atrial enlargement. However, if it's a larger compression, it would be due, it would it would be due to a ventricular enlargement. This is happening to the esophagus, remember, in the retrocardiac space. So that the atrium would cause a minimal or a less significant compression. And the ventricle enlarging, which would cause a secondary enlargement in the atrium, would cause a more stronger uh, compression in the retrocardiac space towards the esophagus. Okay, so basically in summary, we want to ensure we know both anterior and lateral silhouettes and the borders associated with this okay right ventricle most anteriorly here and left ventricle more posteriorly okay moving on we can focus here in the same view of the heart but now taking into consideration the valves and so how we can actually visualize this is by drawing ourselves a perpendicular line towards the uh, right ventricle okay or you can draw just a diagonal line from the point of the right ventricle going posteriorly okay and the two main valves I want you to focus on is the aortic and the mitral valve. The, pul the pulmonary and the tricuspid, these guys aren't too bothered about.
because the aortic and the mitral valve are more susceptible to certain pathologies, okay, and are therefore more identifiable in x-rays, at least to our level of understanding. Now, what I want you to basically have in your mind is that above the line is the aortic valve and below the line is mitral valve, all right? A is first on the alphabet and is above the line, M is later on and it's below the line. And these valves are just above and just below the line. However, you will not be able to see any valves on the lateral radiography unless it's been calcified and it's this calcification which allows us to basically uh, identify due to the uh, increased density in which the x-ray can pick up this radio opacity okay now I want to again ask some questions. Which valve do you think is most at risk for calcification? Now, a lot of people may think that it's the aortic valve, and unfortunately, that's not correct. Reason being is a lot of literature says that the reason the mitral valve is more at risk is just because of the uh, ratio of systolic to diastolic pressure across the valve and the aortic has a lot more diastolic ratio uh, basically a lesser diastolic ratio than the mitral so there's a there's a basically a um, larger gradient across the mitral um, I think that's what it's talking about but anyway regardless of whatever the a reason and reason is the mitral is more at risk to calcification than the aortic valve and I must point out what I'm talking about here is due to physiological deterior deterioration okay if we talk about age as a deteriorating factor the mitral valve is more at risk than the aortic valve if we were to talk about a disease which valve actually first of all which disease actually causes calcification of valves all right one thing that should spring into mind almost immediately is rheumatic heart disease or rheumatism these streptococcal uh, depositions on the leaflets of the valve over time would cause calcifications and fusions and that sort of thing so which valve is more at risk for this rheumatic heart disease is it the aortic valve or the mitral valve well again it's the same valve in the mitral valve is the most susceptible valve of damage if we talk about age the aortic valve does inevitably become calcified. However, aortic valve becomes calcified nearer later in life, around your 60s, and your mitral valve is a bit more earlier, around about 30s and 40s, okay? So, if we look at aortic stenosis, okay? keeping in line with the pathology of stenosis we can see here that again rheumatic heart disease is a causative agent and aging is a causative agent stenosis all in all can be classified or be caused by calcification by fusion of the leaflets or by thickening this can again be to be down due to aging or some other secondary causative agents uh, maybe hypertension and etc etc yeah 
Now, the interesting thing is that kids and adults have different effects on the heart, okay, at least radiographically. Now, kids have pulmonary edema and chronic heart, chronic heart failure, right? So you would see somewhat of a dilatation of the heart. However, in adults, at least in the early stages, I don't know if this is a through and through theory, but potentially this could only be associated with early stages, but I'm not 100%. But what we do know is that the, the adults have a normal heart size when we talk about aortic stenosis. However, the only pathology we can see is that the aorta, the ascending aorta, as you can see here, is dilated. All right, and we call this secondary post stenotic dilatation or post stenotic dilatation. And the actual pathology is in the name. Right after the stenotic valve, we can see dilatation in the aorta. Now there is different uh, there's different explanations in why this is the case. If we simplify it down, we can imagine due to the narrowing of the aortic valve, the heart uh, needs to eject the blood at a greater uh, at a greater force and so this greater force, would cause more of a uh, pressure exertion on the aorta and therefore cause a dilatation. However, there are other theories um, which I'll show you uh, in the... Actually, I'll try and show you now. Okay, so in the lectures, okay, I know this kind of looks a bit mad, but let me just give you some background first. So in the lectures, the teacher talked about this idea of jet regurgitation. G J E T jet regurgitation. Sorry, not jet regurgitation, jet effect. Okay, jet effect of the heart. Now we can see the name appears here. I will get back to this uh, in uh, in a few minutes, but this idea of jet effect. Now, honestly, there's not a lot of information uh, surrounding jet effect primarily on the aortic valve. There is more uh, jet effect information in relation to the mitral However, I came across this image and I came across some other information, okay? Now, when... I don't know, I don't know the reasoning, okay, behind this uh, phenomena, but basically, let's just focus, let's just focus on the valve here. Now, imagine we are... Uh, we are in this image here we have a nice uh tricuspid valve here the aortic valve we have a nice tricuspid physiological valve and over time we get more and more stenosis and until here we have something that is called congenital mitral uh congenital mitral valve and it's called mitral valve because there's there's been a uh, fusion over time of the leaflets and this fusion over time has left us with a congenital valve, okay? So there's a degradation in the leaflets over time leading us to a mitral valve. Basically, in other words, do we can see a degeneration of the tricuspid to mitral or a tricuspid valve and over time there's stenotic degeneration. So basically from left to right we can see degeneration due to mitral stenosis. Keeping that in mind, what do we see here? 
Okay, now we can see that this image is a little bit better. That here there is a equal um, distribution of the ejection fraction of the of the blood. However, as you can see, as we de as we increase the de degeneration of the valve, we can see that there's this kind of skewing of the flow of the um, ejection fraction. Okay, so it becomes more distributable amongst the aortic, uh, the aorta, and then it becomes more skewed and more turbulent. Okay, and it becomes strangely kind of attracted to this, to the walls of the aorta. Okay, and all in all, it just becomes more turbulent, I guess, less uniform. And yeah, you can kind of imagine over time, this will cause some sort of bulging in the wall of the aorta. Okay. Um, like I said, it's not 100%. I haven't got it down. The teacher never really explained it too much. At least in my memory, I might have missed the actual explanation she gave. But yeah, this kind of gives us a little bit of a understanding in which why we would get a, um, a dilatation in the aorta. Now that's stenosis, okay. Keeping again with the theme of stenosis, we do not have one type of stenosis. We have three types. So if a question does come up, saying give the types of aortic stenosis you've heard it here first that there are three types supravalvular above the valve valvular the valve itself subvalvular below the valve now below the valve could be cardiomyopathy it could be septal hypertrophy as you can see here supravalvular could be just prenatal congenital conditions which causes this extra flap uh, above the uh, valves the aortic valves so yeah just understand there are three valves to know three potential stenosis um, possibilities okay above the valve below the valve on the valve okay so this is what i was talking about so, on top of um, the uh, acquired degeneration of the aortic valve, we can have congenital degeneration. And what I mean by congenital uh, degeneration is something called congenital bicuspid valve. Now, this is a, well, as you can see, a congenital condition. And we have calcification due to this in the 30s, in your 30s. Now, possibly a reason for this, like I said, is the jet effect. A bicuspid valve, I can assume, is not, uh, isn't really ideal. It's not really built to withstand the pressures, I guess, of the um, aortic uh, ejection fraction. Okay, so maybe because of the increased pressure and the fact that a mitral valve potentially isn't, isn't specialized to deal with this, we get more of a uh, a rapid enhanced uh, degeneration of the valve at least in comparison if we had a normal valve in which we would get as you can see here calcification much later on in life due to physiological age degeneration okay 
So as you can see here, this bicuspid valve would have a jet effect and like I mentioned before, this jet effect could have this post stenotic dilatation on the aorta, okay, as we have seen before. And finally, so yeah, just to mention with degeneration, there isn't any jet effects as we don't have fusion. Like I mentioned before, don't get too bogged down with this idea jet effect. This is a, this is like something I haven't, you know, studied a lot of time into. <laughs> All right, because we didn't get much information on it. But yeah, if a question does come up saying jet effects, mention congenital bicuspid valve does cause it. Normal degeneration does not cause it. Okay. And if we talk about rheumatic heart disease, here we can have mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation of the aortic valve. All right, we can have either or. All right, so that was, <laughs> yeah, that was something. All right, it's not your everyday. Uh, cup of tea all right it is kind of complicated but hopefully it gave you a bit of insight all right so now let's move on to regurgitation again we can see we have a dilatation of the aorta but again don't be too hasty in making a diagnosis what you can see here in the base of the heart and the apex we can see a ventricular enlargement all right now what you can see here left ventricular enlargement and aortic enlargement now if you think about this all right in a stenosis we shouldn't have ventricular enlargement just because we will not have this returning of blood back to the ventricles due to an insufficient valve. The reason there's an enlargement here is because of this regurgitation, as you guys already know, through internal med and uh, uh, pathophase. If we have a larger volume, a large end diastolic volume, the heart has to work harder through its compensatory mechanism to eject the blood, therefore causing uh, enlargement hypertrophy of the ventricle over time. So here we get a double enlargement, double enlargement, stenosis, singular, stenosis, S, singular, S, and we get this stenotic dilatation. However, with regurgitation, we get this double dilatation. Okay, oh. we are almost to the finish line, don't worry. So now we will focus on mitral stenosis. Here we have two, uh, two, two signs we should look for one early and one late early sign as you can see here in the uh in this image here we can see that there is a straightening sign straightening sign just means basically a straightening of the left heart border which consists as mentioned the left atrium we should see this bulging here which there is less of and leading towards the left ventricle now there is a straightening sign that's all you need to know at least with the early sign of mitral stenosis now as we move into your uh, later signs basically the later sign is apparent in this image <coughs> in this image and the reason the image here is as it is is because of right-sided heart failure 
right-sided heart failure comes uh, due to the increased afterload due to the ineffective emptying of the mitral valve to the um, left ventricle. Now this backflow of blood will cause firstly left atrial enlargement and the reason being is just like the idea of the left ventricular enlargement the left atrium has to pump uh, has to um, basically compensate the ineffective pumping by contracting with a greater force through the stenotic valve and therefore a hypertrophies but over time this can backflow all the way back to the right atrium and the right atrium is having the same issue therefore hypertrophy okay now i want to talk i wanted to talk to you about this phenomenon here which is related to mitral stenosis now the lecturer when she was speaking about the heart specifically she mentioned this phenomena this idea of cephalization cephalization okay now this may seem like kind of complicated you know however it's not too complicated uh, so the definition here is cephalization occurs when the upper lobe vessels in an upright patient okay is larger than the lower lobe vessels when we look at um, the same distance either between the hilum above and below the hilum the upper lobe vessels as you can see here is much more uh, defined okay much more enlarged than as you can see down here this much much more thinner uh, vessels and also as you can see here much more enlarged than the lower vessels now why is that so basically physiologically the lower vessels should be more enlarged than the superior vessels the reason being is because Isaac Newton because of gravity okay because of gravity the blood is being dragged down to the lower vessels and therefore the lower vessels have a greater enlargement than the superior vessels however when you have mitral stenosis and I and as I mentioned we ha you have this backflow of blood all the way to the pulmonary vessels okay this backflow of blood and this uh, increased pressure okay this increased um, uh, increased pressure in an increased flow increased volume in these pulmonary vessels basically the upper lobe vessels is basically a sign of this okay is basically a sign of this and we can see here that there is somewhat a dilatation in the um, aorta okay um, we are having a somewhat uh, dilatation in the uh, right atrium here less so in the left atrium but yeah as you can the point is with cephalization we have more uh, we have more enlargement more blood uh, flow uh, more vascularity in the upper lobe vessels than the lower lobe vessels just because of this backflow of blood because in a physiological state the lower lobe vessels should be greater just because of gravity now i'm going to show you two more heart signs okay and then we'll move on to the last slide two more heart signs so i gave you 
some art signs uh, already the uh, specifically the straightening heart sign due to mitral stenosis firstly here we can see this animal which I guess is called a shmoo whatever it is right probably a Nicki Minaj shmoo uh, we we have a left ventricular enlargement all right when you see this bulging of course you should already know that the left ventricle is here this is our left ventricular aspect of the left border okay if this is enlarged here we know that it's a problem with the left ventricle and this can be depicted as the shmoo sign <clears throat> moving on here we can see something labeled the water bottle sign aka the pericardial effusion now as you can see here we can see this kind of baseline bulging of the heart right it's definitely more than 50 percent the ratio and as you can see here it resembles a bike filled with water or a bottle and yeah this is typical of pericardial effusion okay finally drawing to a close we have some scanning methods of the heart okay things to keep in mind uh, if any heart question comes up specifically about scanning here are some potential um, questions and answers okay so with firstly the first scanning method we can do is an angiography basically this is where you insert a dye into the heart okay and we use an x-ray to look at any potential blockages or anything and so what would happen is the teacher mentioned a a uh, mechanism a uh, uh, a method of achieving this and she called it a the cell dinger method let me write this down um, I'm on my laptop here so it won't be too pretty cell cell dinger you can search this up in your own time but basically it's the method in which we insert a catheter and it goes from the arm all the way to the coronary arteries in which we are uh, particular particularly interested in and yeah we can see the coronary arteries however this isn't just limited to the arteries we can insert our angiograph through the veins as well through the femoral veins okay in the the in the femoral veins specifically femoral veins okay now with the second scanning method we can have a coronary computed tomography or a CTA so basically the CT represents CT scan and here what we have to use is an IV contrast all right so with this view obviously with CT we will have a more highly uh, a high resolution of the heart 3d view of the heart and with CT you should already know it gives a good spatial spatial uh, special view spatial resolution of the heart and also something quite exclusive to CT it gives us the ability to recognize to identify density and density is measured in what can you remember density is measured in units called that's a H by the way house field units HU is the initials house field units 
But if we look at MRA, MR, basically an MRI, but specifically for angiograms, here the difference is, firstly, we don't need to use a contrast, and that's important because uh, some things that you need to know, which we may be given a question of, is the potential side effects to um, contrast material. You can have like mild, moderate, severe, yeah. So make sure you look at those. And so with MRAs, you don't have to have a contrast. And with um, your MRAs, here the MRIs is better equipped to look at the tissue characteristics. It's more specialized in tissue characteristics, okay? So yeah, that is your MRAs. And finally, you have your echocardiograph or your echoes, as you're aware of. We have two methods of applying this, transthoracic, basically in front, basically on the body, and transesophageal or transesophageal. This is within your esophagus, okay? And the reason you would do an echo is because of your, you're basically looking for structural malformations, structural defects, either in the vessels or in the valves, okay? And there are some extra points here to know. I'm not going to go into it really, but yeah, there are different types of modes that you can use an echo. There's something like an, an M mode. M mode and there's other modes as modes of application as well but yeah just to keep it simple you have four types of scanning methods of the heart um, of course you would have the standard x-ray okay this will be your um, initial uh, scanning um, method but obviously yeah you have your more specialized methods here as well and so yeah that brings us to the end of this quite long but hopefully informative video I hope you guys enjoyed and yeah I'll leave it there I will potentially be carrying on and focusing on the GIT as we have covered the lungs and we have now covered the heart. And yeah, there are two systems left to do, the GIT and the renal system. So yeah, look out for those videos coming up on the channel. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and yeah, take care and see you soon.